This is a top 5 takeaway summary of The Signal and the Noise, a book about the art and the science of predictions, written by Nate Silver. Takeaway number 1. The Signal and the Noise Ever since the creation of the printing press in 1439, the amount of information that can be stored and reused later has exploded. And this has only been enhanced even further with the spread of the internet. Information created and shared seems to grow at an exponential pace. The problem is just that uh, the amount of useful information is not increasing at the same rate. Say, for instance, that you're an investor and you would like to predict how the economy will do during the next five years to tell if you should put your money in the stock market or not. Well, you have more than 45,000 economic indicators to choose from that are produced by the US government only. But which ones are relevant and which ones are not? Which ones are signal and which ones are noise? It's important to be able to tell this difference if we want to make our predictions reliable. According to Nate Silver, The signal is the truth. The noise is what distracts us from the truth. The goal of a prediction model should be to capture as much as possible of the signal while keeping the noise to a minimum. Let's pretend, uh, for instance, that unemployment rate is the signal. It is what can help us predict how the economy will do for the next five years. Then all the other 44,999 economic indicators are noise. They are just distracting us from realizing that it's only unemployment rate that we should be focusing on. The problem is that we humans have a hyperactive pattern recognition. It may have helped us thousands of years ago to distinguish whether the rattle from that bush is just a bird or if it's a lion, but it's harming us when making forecasts because we tend to identify more patterns among the noise. More on this in Daniel Kahneman's book, by the way, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. And also more on this in takeaway number three. The productivity paradox is a central part of this book. We face danger whenever information growth outpaces our understanding of how to process it. Takeaway number two. We have a prediction problem. Just before the outbreak of the financial crisis, the rating agencies had given their top ratings, the AAA, to thousands of mortgage-backed securities. Some of these were said to have only a 0.12% risk of defaulting. How many of them do you think defaulted in reality? A whopping 28%. That's 200 times more than S&P had predicted. In 1990, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, forecasted that the rise of temperature would most likely be at a rate of 3 degrees Celsius per century, but definitely no less than 2 degrees per century going forward. As of 2011, when Nate Silver released The Signal and the Noise, the increase has been just 1.5 degrees Celsius. Here's how economists have forecasted the GDP during the 18 years between 1993 and 2010. In the chart, the bars represent the area where the economists have said that GDP growth has a 90% chance of ending up. As you can see, the economists have been correct 12 times out of 18, or only 66% of the time. That is quite far from their stated 90%. Alright. So apparently, at least in some fields, we are terrible at making predictions. And yes, you could blame black swan events for these failed forecasts like the S&P did. But uh, in reality, it's much more likely that the fault is in the model of the forecaster than in the world itself. We should show some sympathy though, because there are situations in which predictions are extra difficult to make. Event is out of sample. To think that housing prices could have such a major effect on the economy seemed quite unlikely looking at historical data. The problem was just that in 2006, historical data didn't help much in making a prediction 
as the conditions were vastly different than ever before. Never had the economy been so highly leveraged, and never had so many side bets been made on housing prices. Dynamic Systems When the behavior of the system at one point in time influences its behavior in the future, we have a dynamic system. This means that, even if we are just slightly off in assessing the current state of the system, we will end up very wrong when predicting the future of it, as mistakes multiply over time. This is the reason why we can forecast the weather accurately a few days ahead, but not more than that. A lack of theory Simply put, we just don't know enough about many of these systems. The economy, just like the climate, are complex beasts, and uh, although we have some heuristics, or rules of thumb, that we can conform to, it's not always enough to make accurate predictions. Takeaway number 3. Correlation does not equal causation. A mafia boss gives one of his minions three different locks with codes. A red, a blue and a yellow one. He asks for a method to pick such locks. After a few days, the underling is back, happily stating that uh, If it's a red lock, just enter 1645. If it's blue, 3493. And if it's yellow, 0232. The underling would have mistaken correlation for causation and would completely have failed his task. There's no reasonable explanation for why the color red would have a person enter the exact digits 1645. It just happened to be so in this particular case. Let's take another example. Is it true that consumption of ice cream causes shock attacks? Well, from this chart, you may come up with that conclusion, as it's quite clear that shock attacks increase whenever the ice cream consumption does. But Obviously, there's no causal relationship here. The ice cream consumption does not cause shock attacks. It's just that both swimming in the ocean, which uh, makes us more likely to get attacked by a shock, and eating ice cream is more enjoyable in the summer. While these examples may seem a bit silly, mistaking causation for correlation is a very common forecasting problem. As stated earlier, there are 45,000 economic indicators produced by the US government each year. If you are trying to predict the stock market, for example, and you look at historical data to do this, you are almost guaranteed to find that some of these variables seem to have strong predictive power. Yet, they may not. You may just have been fooled by randomness. Whenever you make a prediction, be sure that there's a logical explanation for the mathematical relationship. Do not trust data unconditionally. Takeaway number four. How can we become better at predicting? Here are three examples on how we can become better forecasters. Think probabilistically. Reality is not a yes-no situation, even though some people seem to think that. For example, if I ask you how the stock market will perform next year, what is the best answer? It's not, uh, for example, 5%. And it's not minus 5%, uh, minus 1%, uh, or 10% either. The best answer is a spectrum of outcomes, with probabilities attached to them. Good predictors are great at seeing reality as such, and have developed a skill for assigning probabilities to outcomes. For more on how to apply this in the stock market, please see my summary of The Dando Investor. Change the forecast with new evidence. Say that uh, you are dealt two aces in poker, the best starting hand possible. You decide to bet, and you are called by one of your opponents. The first three cards on the table are the following. Nine of spades, ten of spades, and jack of spades. He checks. You bet, and he calls. The fourth card is an eight of spades. Your opponent decides to bet. Should you call this bet or not? Your initial forecast was that you were going to win this hand easy, but clearly you must factor in the new evidence. 
you are beaten by an awful many straights and flushes and should definitely fold this hand. You should make the best forecast today, regardless of what you said yesterday. More on this in the final takeaway. Look for consensus. Good predictors are good at weighing multiple sources of information. They don't get lost in narratives or stories and they are able to weigh both quantitative and qualitative information together before making their decisions. For example, they understand that Netflix can be a great stock to buy because it has an enormous potential for scalability. But simultaneously, they realize that it's quite expensive to buy a stock, no matter how great it may be, for 130 times its last year's earnings. Takeaway number 5. Bayes Theorem You come home after you've been on a weekend with the boys to uh, Prague, only to find a pair of pants under your bed that you are certain are not yours. Has your girlfriend been cheating on you while you've been gone? You've been holding on to that Tesla stock for quite a while now, and uh, this very evening they reported an update that uh, the Model 3 seems more difficult to mass-produce than first anticipated. Will Tesla go bankrupt? Both of these examples involve updating a previous forecast when new evidence has presented itself. Most humans are terrible at this. Luckily, there is a solution. Bayes Theorem Bayes Theorem is a mathematical formula that can help you in calculating the probability of something occurring given that something else has happened. The mathematical equation looks like this. Let's apply it to our first example. You must make some assumptions regarding three different events. Firstly, what would you estimate that the probability of her cheating on you would have been before you found this new piece of evidence? Let's say that it's uh, 4%. Apparently, that is some kind of uh, national average. Secondly, if she really is cheating on you, how likely is it that the guy would forget his pants? Well, not too likely, probably. Let's say uh, 20%. Thirdly, what's the probability that these pants are here if she's not cheating on you? Perhaps she has a brother who visits sometimes. With these assumptions, we can calculate that the probability that she's been cheating, given that you found the pants, is 14%. Not so high, after all. So please don't confront your girlfriend uh, screaming and crying uncontrollably just yet. But recognize that it's much higher than our initially expected 4%. If we find another pair of pants a year later, we will have to revise this and update our probability to 39%. Successful predictors in any field recognize this. When new information presents itself, we must update our initial hypothesis. Perhaps we didn't think that Tesla would go bankrupt the first time they presented a liquidity issue, but if new problems constantly arise, we must update our estimates. People may see this as a sign of weakness. Oh, look at that guy. He's constantly changing his mind. But it's actually the most rational thing to do. Only when we are constantly refining our estimates can we come closer to the signal and further away from the noise. Here's a summary in less than 53 seconds. The signal is the truth. The noise is what distracts us from the truth. More data means more noise in relation to the signal. Some situations are particularly difficult to forecast, especially when an event is out of sample, we are forecasting dynamic systems, and when there's a lack of theory in the domain. Correlation does not mean causation. Make sure that there's a logical explanation for the mathematical relationship before using it in your predictions. We can become better at predicting by thinking probabilistically, updating our forecasts when we are presented with new evidence, and by looking for consensus. Use Bayes' theorem, or at least think in a Bayesian way, when new information presents itself. Cheers, guys!